mental. Now, Jesus himself, he alluded to the fact of the threefold narrative. In the book of Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40, Jesus drew reference to Jonah. He said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale of the fish for three days and three nights, he said, even so, the son of man will be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. Of course, you're going there from the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and verse 17. Then in the book of Matthew, chapter, Mark, chapter 14 and verse 58, and John, chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus made a statement that was very profound. He made quite, quite clear. He said, I know. I will you destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it again. Now naturally you're talking about the temple of your body you, yeah. and the people couldn't understand it. Yeah. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he made it quite specific in the book of Mark chapter 8 and verse 31 that he will die and the third day he will rise again. People. So Jesus yeah. specifically made it quite clear that this three days in the belly of the earth was not something that just simply happened coincidentally or happened to rise up without any purpose, he'll make it quite clear that this is what will happen. Three days, I will die. And in three days, I will be raised again from the dead. When we understand all of that, does it come as a surprise, therefore, that Jesus Christ was laid in the tomb for three days. And I want to ask the question, if it were three days specifically ordained of God, preplanned by God, if not therefore the idea of something specific, something definite, that God wanted to communicate or God wanted done, or God wants to accomplish, I believe, beloved, that it really is. Let me look at the text again. He was delivered according to my, the scripture Paul declares, and was buried according to our scriptures, and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. It means, therefore, that this was prophetic. It means, therefore, it had to be fulfilled. He could not be in that grave for two days, neither could he be in the grave for four days. It was specifically ordained of God that he would be in that grave for three days. Now, having said that, I need us to ponder on the thing. What was the reason? What was the purpose? What did God want to accomplish? For God never does anything without a purpose. Everything that God has ever done and does and will ever do is because of the abundance of purpose. So the, three, the third day resurrection is a scriptural imperative. It had to happen. It had to take place. It was not coincidental. The three days were foreordained and predetermined by God. After the burial, three days would pass before his resurrection. Now, there are some very pertinent 
things I wanted to take a hold of. What was he doing? What was taking place? Mm -hmm. The Lord, we are told, was taken down from the grave, from the cross, wrapped in fine linen, and placed in a newly hewn out tomb, a rich man tomb. Nobody had ever laid there. And then to make it so safe, we had the tomb was sealed. The stamp of Rome was upon that seal. Nobody could break it. And in and, and, and soldiers were placed to keep guard to make sure that nothing uneventful would take place, to make sure that he will never get out of there, and to make sure that the disciples could never steal his body. And they can't go and tell some lie that it was actually raised. That was what they were thinking. But here he was in the grave for today. Now, here are some pointers. Number one, he was not asleep. Neither was he in a coma in that grave. There was nothing like soul sleep. You're going to see from the word of God that Jesus was very, very active. Secondly, he was actively engaged executing the mandate of God. So first of all, he was not asleep, neither was he in a coma. Secondly, he was actively engaged executing the mandate of God. What was God's purpose? Why he was in that grave for three days? What was he doing? Let's turn to some scripture. The first scripture I want to look at is the book of Ephesians chapter 4. And I will take time to make sure that we read it. Ephesians chapter 4. And we'll read a few verses there. Verses 8 and 9. And I want you to join me. If you take a note, you take some note also. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 8. Wherefore, he said, when he ascended upon high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts unto men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But that he also descended first into a lower part of the earth. And <laughs> verse 10, he that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fulfill all things. Now let's take it one by one. Jesus, we are told, that before he arose, he descended into a lower part of the earth. Now, that lower part of the earth, according to Ephesians, is a place called Hades or Sheol. Now, Sheol or Hades, was the place of departed spirits. When people die, their spirits went to Sheol or Haiti. Now, this is called hell, not hell in the context of the lake of fire. That is to be very, very clearly understood. The lake of fire is going to be in the future. Now, remember in the book, of Mark, of, sorry, sorry, Luke rather, the story is told there about the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Rich man died and we're told in hell, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Lazarus afar off. Now, they were in the same vicinity, but there was a line of demarcation. The people who died without Christ in their life, they went into an area where they were in torment and suffering and agony and pain. But they could have seen those on the other side because the, the Abraham told the rich man, 
there's a gulf between us and you. So you can't come to us, neither can Lazarus come to you. So the part where there was the residing of the people who died in God, that is the part where there was peace and joy and comfort and embracing at that time called Abraham bosom. Now Jesus went down there. What did he go down there for? He said he went and he went and he led captivity captive. In other words, the environment, the place was a place of captivity. Captives were there who were being kept captive by the enemy, the devil himself. Paul declares in the book of Hebrews chapter 2, which I'll come to later on, that when the Lord died, he delivered those who are all their lifetime subject to bondage. So here they were in bondage. But somebody had to go and get them out. So when Jesus was put in the tomb, beloved, he was not sleeping. <laughs> he was not in a coma. He was not dreaming. He was actively quickened by the Holy Spirit. You see, before he actually came out upon the earth, he was quickened by the Holy Spirit and the quickened Christ who was quickened by the Holy Spirit is actively engaged executing the mandate of God. Because remember, the Bible declared that he must put everything under his feet. And not all power must be given unto him. Now, when he went there, therefore, he led captivity captive. That means those who are in the captivity area, he captured them, brought them out of the captivity. And bringing them out into freedom, bringing them out into liberty. The Bible also tells us in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 18 and 19. It will be instructive if you look at that. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verses 18 and 19. And it reads as follows. You have it? Follow me there. By which also, let me take verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Look at it now. Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. <laughs> By which also he went and preached unto the spirit in prison. So the departed spirits of the people of God were imprisoned. <laughs> Jesus went down there, quickened by the Holy Spirit, and preached the message of deliverance and preached the message of. Freedom, captivity, captive. Those who are in the compartment of being captured, he now captured them. And not only them, but the very location was released, was relieved, and made free from the bondage of constraint. He Told us here in the word that the same spirit that quickened him. Now all of this had taken place before he came out of the grave. The Holy Ghost quickened him in that body, in that grave. 
raise him up then and use him to go down there into the very depths of the earth where folk are kept in bondage, imprisoned, and preach unto them the word of deliverance and let them know they are free. That is not far-fetched. Do you recall, beloved, in the book of Matthew chapter 27, there is a phenomenon that took place there. We can so many times miss it because in reading the narrative, you know, we feel to sometimes we don't pay attention to it. But I know that you have done it in the past. The book of Matthew chapter 27. Look for the taking place here from verse 51 of Matthew chapter 27. And I hope that you are looking into it and you are following me as I try to share this thought with you. Matthew. And behold, the veil of the temple rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did quake and the rocks rent and the graves were opened and many bodies of the sage which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now when Jesus gave up the ghost and said it is finished, suddenly a tremendous earthquake rocked the entire earth. The place shook, the graves were opened, the veil with temples rent in two from the top to the bottom. God was saying that which was a barrier that which was the hindrance is no longer there. He wrecked it, and this is not done from earth, it is done from heaven. The way Bible says, from the top to the bottom. And something phenomenal took place. The body of the saints who slept arose. Matthew, they arose, they were, they were resurrected, but they did not come out of the grave. They came out only after he came out. In other words, they could not come out before him because they became his first fruits. And the fruit must not come before the one who bears them. And therefore, these folk came out alive. That's why the Bible will be quite clear. He will come again, bringing his sheaves with him. And that was what happened down there, beloved. Jesus Christ went down to Hades, went down to Sheol, and all the saints of God who were kept in bondage, who were kept in prison by the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon his body. He declared, he declared deliverance. He declared freedom. The way Paul declares, he led captivity captive. Let them out of that place. Now, it did not just simply stop there, but he removed the location from the environment where they were and transferred them above the earth. That's why we are told in Hebrews chapter 2 and verses 14 and 15. The tremendous language there that Paul, the apostle, is talking about. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partake of the flesh and blood, he also likewise himself took part of the same, that through death, he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. You see, beloved, the death of Jesus was a destructive element against the devil and the works of the devil. By death, he destroyed.
destroyed him who had the power of death. We don't have to speculate. It says, who is the devil? Having done that and delivered them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now, it doesn't mean that the people were afraid to die. It means as long as they were dead already, as we saw there in Peter, but being in the environment, they were always confronted by death. They always were looking at the horror and the pain and the agony of death. They were always confronted. But when Jesus delivered them, he removed the whole place from there up into a place called paradise. <laughs> and I want to point out some things profound here to you, beloved. It is just this morning I discovered that. I used to think that paradise was a word that has been used a long, long, long time. But do you know the word paradise? The very first time it was used in the Bible, it was Jesus who used it upon the cross. The word paradise is mentioned only three times in the Bible. And the very first person who used that word was Jesus Christ himself. In the book of Luke chapter 23 and verse 43. When the thief on the cross said, My Lord, when you come into your kingdom, remember me. Jesus said, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Beloved, paradise only existed after the death of Jesus. There was no paradise. It mentioned only three times in the entire Bible. And the first time it came out the mouth of Jesus himself. He was the first one who used the word paradise. And he was using the word to signify that there's where people will go after death because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Not before, but after Calvary. Therefore, when they took down his dead body and put it in that grave, and the Holy Ghost went into a grave and quickened him. He went down into Hades, into Sheol, and preached repentance and deliverance unto people bound in prison there and set them free. And move it. That's why when he came out of the grave, a whole multitude of the saints who slept, who died, came out. And walked the streets of jail. They saw them. It was no phantom. It was no fantasy. It was real. You know why? Because Jesus had done the job. The job had been done. He declared in the book of Rome, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18. He said, I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I'm alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. The word keys there signify absolute authority, absolute control. Jesus is saying, I have done the job. The one who had the keys, the one who had control, I have snatched it from him. You know, when the devil had the audacity to tempt Jesus, he told Jesus that all the kingdoms of the earth belong to him, the devil, and he will give it to whom he will. His words were, these were delivered to me. These were delivered. And the Lord never told me he was lying. He said, all right. The time did come when Satan must know that his rule is forever over. 
Jesus went down there and preached a message of deliverance, the message of hope, the message of life. Having done that, he snatched those who died in Christ, who died with their faith in God from the Old Testament and the New Testament. He snatched them away. And to make sure the devil understood who was the boss now, he went up to the devil and he said to him, he said, come on now, devil, stand up. And I can see my spirit, the devil standing up in the middle of all the people whom he had actually deceived. And Jesus said to him, look at me, look into my eyes. Don't even blink, don't even wink. Look into my eyes. And the devil could not be refused. He stared into the eyes of Jesus and the flame of those eyes seemed to shoot back into the eyes of the devil. And he began to blink like if you're blinded. And the Lord said to the devil, give me that key. I'm not begging you. I'm not negotiating with you. I am commanding you, give me that key. <laughs> and the devil, he did not drop it on the ground. He delivered it. He bolted and said all the powers of the world were delivered to him. Christ now said, you deliver that key to me right now. And the devil delivered the key. And Jesus turned to come back out of that grave. But before he turned back, he said, I forgot one thing. He said, there's one more thing I should do, devil, before I leave. That is to bruise your head. He said, lie down. Lie down, Satan. And the devil lie down. And he's going, Lord, give him three stamp. Bam, bam, bam. Take that. Good night until later on. Because later on, I'll fix you for good. And when the Lord did that, put the stamp upon Satan's head, he was fulfilling what God declared in the Garden of Eden. Yes. That the devil might have bruised his heel, but he will crush the devil's head. And Jesus did just that. He stamped his head, took the key, and came out and declared, Hail, I am he who lives and was dead and behold I'm alive. And I have the keys. <laughs> I have the keys of hell and of death. Beloved, that was what happened. And the three days was over. It was all done. And when it was all done, the Holy Spirit, who quickened his body, called the earth again to begin to tremble. A tremendous earthquake and the stone rolled away. And Jesus rose out of the grave. Up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph of his foes. He arose a victor from the dark domain and he lives forever with his sins to reign. He arose. He arose. Hallelujah. Christ arose. Yes, beloved, he's alive. It was not by chance. It was not coincidental. Jesus raised from the dead the third day because it was according to a scripture. And today we can lift our hands and shout. We can lift our hands and sing. We can lift our hands and praise. He arose like a mighty victor from the dark domain and he lived with the saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah. Christ rose. This was what was done, beloved. 
And this was what has happened. Paradise has now been established and the people of God have no fear because he lives. We shall live also. I trust that God has used this word to comfort you, to give you that new hope again, to bring in the time of pandemic. We have a lively hope that was given to us when God raised Jesus from the dead. My prayer is that your entire family, entire household will enjoy the bliss and the joy of Easter and look at the bigger picture that no grave will hold our body down. The Lord will come again for those who look for him without sin unto purity, unto salvation. May God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that the hand of the Lord will be extended upon every family member where this message has been heard, every household. Let the sick be healed. Let the broken be mended. Let the sorrowful be made joyful. And let the lame leap for joy. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you. We love you. On behalf of Sister Anthony.